How you been? Good. There's a lot happening. I mean, I'm kind of excited to get back to my normal self, right? My normal, like, content creating self. I got, I got sucked away to the world of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth for what felt like a month and some weeks, right? So now I'm like getting back and playing fighting games again and, you know, separating myself from this game a little bit, but still able to play it and check it out and continue through hard mode. But it just like absorbed my life. Game legit absorbed my whole ass life for a very long period of time. The only other game that did that for that long was Elden Ring, where it's like, Jesus, man, I got to get back to being a normal human. I gotta like get just get back to like what do I do now that I'm not like playing this game all the time, man? Like holy shit! So there's a little bit of a um, what's it called? Separation anxiety. There's a little bit of like separation anxiety when it came to like the Elden Ring playthrough and also FF7 Rebirth. So yeah, getting back and playing like MKX felt really nice. Getting back and playing more Tekken just feels really good. It's like yeah, okay, I exist outside of this game. <laughs> you know, I do exist. Outside of that experience, we're good, you know? Crack the Gongaga music, that's a good idea. All right, so this is probably gonna confirm a lot of stuff that we've already figured out. I'm gonna say it right now. The, the, the big reveal from this Ultimania is likely just gonna give us some context on the stuff we saw, but I, I do not think that the Ultimania is going to be a, effectively a decisive, um, here's what's happening based on the previous Ultimania, what happened with Remake, where it's like, okay, the Ultimania is going to give us all the answers when we beat Remake, right? It did not. It did not. All it did was just sort of confirm our speculations already without giving us answers. Because they don't want to, they don't want to give us answers. We came to this conclusion. You beat Rebirth, and it's painfully clear the devs want us to ask questions, not get answers yet. We need answers, or we're going to get those answers in seemingly the next game. So... They confirm six different worlds based on Stamp's appearance, with perhaps the unknown one as well, which is the place where Zack appears in the church at the end. Right, because we don't know where he is here. That's the whole point. Um, Zack's last stand against the Shinra soldiers takes place in a different world than the one we know. Okay. The worlds are differentiated by the Stamp Dog appearance. Right. Sephiroth knows about these worlds and is trying to extend the life of the planet. Interesting. That's weird. White materia that Aerith in the current world has is supposed to counter Meteor, but it's lost its power. Yeah. The Aerith from another world entrusts the white materia to Cloud so we can deliver it to the Aerith in the current world. And we don't know if the white materia does the same thing as this. We don't actually know. You know, gotta remember, white materia in the old game summons Holy. What does it do? It doesn't work! Let's, let's remember that about the OG Final Fantasy VII. The white materia goes off, it functions, it tries to stop it, but it's too late. And then Aerith has to show up and use the life stream as a weapon to protect, you know, the planet. Uh, depending on Zack's choices, worlds become divided. Yes, we get that. Several points where it's like, oh, you know, every time Zack does something, he deviates the timeline because he's like aware that he's fucked up fate. He's almost like kind of aware of it. It seems like every time his weird, f like uh, his his existence now is like fucking up fate in every single way. He became the uh, the variant, right? Zack is 100% the variant here. So at the moment, there are six different worlds based on the stamp dogs, right? The world where Zack last appears doesn't have a stamp dog to refer to, so where is that world exactly? Yes. I think these are related. Here's my interpretation from this shit. My interpretation is... It doesn't matter in the end. My interpretation is we get to see so many different worlds and so many different dogs. We get to see so many things that it's like, does it really matter anymore? By the, by, at the, at the end of the game. Now they're important. They want you to know that these are all different, but it's like, are we going to flip flop between all of them? Six different places, six or more, like consistently through the next game. Why would we do that? It doesn't seem like that's feasible because we only really focus on like two. We focus on the one where, you know, Zack's alive for some reason, Aerith and Cloud are in a coma. We focus on our main one. Then we get little hints at other ones towards the end of the game. So it's like, so why do we need to focus on six to 12 worlds? No, no, no. I think the whole point is that Shit. 
we're back here we're back to one and why don't they want to tell us where where is zach in the end why don't they want to tell us where he is here oh because i think he's in our world i think he's in ours now that's the reveal that's just my personal opinion he could be in some world where he's gonna go on dates with Aerith and shit and he's gonna kiss barrett there could be plenty of shit but i think it makes the most sense that he's with us now that means that uh potentially seven worlds of course there is and the world of differentiating by the Beagle, the Terrier, the Yorkshire Terrier, the Pug, the Corgi, the Chihuahua. Um, they were created when Zack's choices uh, were being made. Yeah, Mr. Variant is making other timelines. This very much li aligns up with the way they approach like multiverse shit in Loki season one. I didn't see season two. It very much is where it's like if one variant happens, then it starts to splinter and create all these other ones. So you have to attack it before it does that shit, right? So just to note, there are two Yorkshire Terrier worlds as the breed is the same, but the appearance of the dog looks different. And both represents different worlds. To further confirm, Nojima also confirms in the interview that there are indeed multiple worlds, but perhaps different from parallel worlds. Yeah. If we already didn't get the idea that there's multiple worlds, they're just telling us there is. And it's like, yeah, we know, man. <laughs> we know. <laughs> the rainbow effect represents a new world creation. 273 rainbows, not including limit breaks. So is there 273 worlds? This is why I don't fall for the rainbow shit, bro. This is why, like, I, I call it rainbow chasing. Many of the initial videos from, like, IGN and GameSpot and stuff, which are good, that break down the events of the end of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, start eventually getting towards rainbow intention rainbow effect intention and discussion when it's like okay so we don't actually know what that means and that effect being one thing specifically sort of like cakes into everything else so it's like i don't know if i buy that it definitely is there to represent something but it exclusively is like new creation of this or it is that or it is that we have no clue bro I'm not anti-rainbow theory. I'm just, I'm just not in the boat that everything, all the rainbow theory means one thing. I don't think so, man. I think it's obviously a visual cue, but I don't think it all is, is what everyone sort of boils it down to meaning one thing. It symbolizes something, but I don't think it symbolizes like what all the videos were sort of saying it is. Oh, it means there's a new timeline. So there's a new timeline. This is a different, this is a different character. That's a different character. It's like, how do you know that? <laughs> Wait, excuse me? Uh, Nojima confirms there's indeed multiple worlds, and that aspect of the story along with the mystery surrounding Aerith's white materia will be made clear. Oh. Well, that's cool. Wait a minute. Answers? Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. That, that's actually a bigger deal than I think you might realize, chat. Telling us that that stuff will be made clear? That you're gonna, like, let us know? They should just call it Final Fantasy VII Part Three Answers actually telling us what this stuff is like information instead of just subtext huh <laughs> only four more years in fact he says he is almost done writing the main scenario for part three and there will be a tumultuous buildup of events leading to the ending but he hopes that I oh yeah oh i get that man nojima you're cooking you don't write characters the way you write ff7 remake and rebirth without cooking some shit i'll give you credit you obviously had two games of buildup don't get me wrong and that is now tough. That's tough on people that like these characters and want to know where they're going and shit. But it's painfully clear that you know where you're taking this and it's going to lead to something very dire. And a tumultuous buildup is probably a good way of describing it. And it's good that it's coming from the man's mouth himself. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, and I'm confident. I'll be real. I'm relatively confident. Toriyama also mentions he hopes to bring an amazing conclusion for the world of Final Fantasy VII in Part Three. Uh, the interview was made February 2nd, so Nojima should be done with the main story already. Nomura says, the words of the end, no promise await at journey's end, is a translation of two messages. There is no promise to the end of the journey, and the end has nothing decided. <laughs> sure, bro. We're also actively listening to fan theories. Uh, Nomura says in the Ultimania interview that he actually wanted to have FF7 Remake Part 2 be titled Reunion. But since that title went to Crisis Core, he couldn't use it. Chat, you can shut up about this now, okay? Everybody thinking the next game's gonna be called Reunion. Even Nomura wanted to call Rebirth Reunion. He says he has not disclosed Part 3's title to anyone. So pack it up. Part 3 is most likely not gonna be called Reunion based on how Nomura said he couldn't use it. 
We can all shut the hell up about this shit. I, I actually like what Audrey is going with here. I think Return or Returns is great. I think that's a great title for the final game. But, you know, I don't know their actual intent with the story and the actual game itself. I have no clue. But I think Return or Returns is a very powerful title. Uh, Nomura says that Glenn was originally a character made for FF7 Rebirth. Later became the main character of Ever Crisis. Who exactly Glenn and the mysterious Saruf is will be revealed in part three. <laughs> well, he's fucking dead, right? Uh, Nomura has an interesting comment in the Rebirth Ultimania where he says the line from the release date trailer, the world will be saved, but will you, is intertwined with Aerith's fate. Cool. Yeah, she has a line of dialogue like that towards the EO uh, when she gives Cloud the white materia, you know? Hamaguchi says that in Rebirth Ultimania part three should cover parts related. Oh, Jesus, this is huge. Parts related to the OG. Icicle in Northern Crater, the awakening of the weapons, flying around in airships. I wouldn't doubt you for a second, Amaguchi-san. However, he is wondering how exactly to represent the freedom of flying in an airship with a game of such high graphic detail. He hopes to be able to bring something to surprise the experience, much like how part one and part two introduced new and exciting features. You guys already figured it out, okay? You already figured it out. I get it. It was challenging, most likely. I understand that it was probably very challenging, but if you had not figured that out already, then you probably wouldn't be talking about it. Now you're just hyping us up because you probably have something very cool already for the next game. Do I think they can do it? I don't think they can do it. I think they've already done it. They have a solution. They just have to implement it. Otherwise, if they did not have a solution for this, they would not be talking about it. So I trust them, dude. We already get a huge hint at this shit by using the tiny Bronco in, in the current game, where it's like, oh, they already have a scalable world map? That's fucking weird. Wait a minute. We shouldn't be doing this yet in this game. You let us do this here? You already have a scalable world map? Like a, 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 a low quality version, high quality version of it? I'm like, dude, you're already halfway there, Square. This isn't a tease. This is sort of showing us that you have solutions in place for large world map shit. Granted, it's on a small scale at that point. PS5 Pro, it won't require the Pro. It won't require the Pro. To be frank, dude, to be honest, like Final Fantasy Rebirth running how good it does, even on PlayStation 5, is really impressive. You have to remind yourself that entire world is traversable with no loading. You get you, from one end of the world to the complete other, the only time you have a, a, a gap in in playability is getting off of the boat to another area. But you can just go across the entire ocean, through the rivers, across the whole map, dock within a second, get off of the dock and run around the world, and then just run through the entirety of it in the other direction. It's like the combat simulator, on the other hand, <laughs> that shit's really impressive. So Nomura explains the symbolism of, of the CG art. Cloud's name Cloud represents the stormy sky on the left. Zach's lattice name Fair represents the sky on the right. Cute. The skies intersect in the middle with Sephiroth dyed red to symbolize Meteor, representing each one of their fates changing. You definitely felt something crazy going on with that shit. A bit on the nose. It is a bit on the nose, but it this key art, when it first was revealed, was like, a, like an immediate, what? It, it already was evoking some emotions, so they did a good job. Uh, Nomura specifically asked the team to add in Yuffie's first love story into the Golden Saucer date. He explains when he first saw the remastered scene where Yuffie first meets Zack in Crisis Core Reunion, he wanted that moment to leave an impression on her memories. Then he asked the team to include that little tidbit about her first love. So I don't know how this scene is received with a lot of people. I loved it. I think this scene is incredibly charming. It's so cute. The way it plays out too is insanely cute. That like a young Yuffie um, Zach leaves an impression on her. It's very sweet. It's very innocent. It's very teenager. And the way it plays out after this with Cloud is... This is so sweet. Like, I haven't seen a scene like this in a game in a long time, if not ever. It's so, like, I, I guess heartwarming is the best way to describe it. It's just very heartwarming. They ask, why was there a single feather at the start of the journey? Nomura laughs and says, perhaps it's something to do with something with an angel quote-unquote angel in quotations. I wonder if it implies that Zack was brought to life after Angeal pulls him up at the end of Crisis Core Reunion with the feathers surrounding him. Well, I mean, yeah, but, but Zack already, it's not specifically Angeal, right? The white feather thing is also present 
just in general from Zack. Not, not as much like the one-winged angel. I, I think it's more of a, a, a Zack sort of thing, which also is tied to Angeal because Angeal, Zack carries Angeal's ambitions, you know? He literally carries Angeal's legacy. Nojima says that the gold saucer date resolution scenes, people have high expectations, so he hopes you can enjoy it as a fun part of the game and slightly removed from the story, right? He says that what they created for the gold saucer's affinity dates kind of reminds him of a dating sim. It does. The answer was given for the comment, um, was made by the interviewer regarding Tifa and Cloud kiss scene during the gold saucer date. Uh, yeah, like almost all of them could be not canon. In my head, what they're trying to say here is that none of them are canon. None of them specifically, this is removed from the story. The only one similar to the OG game, which is like, okay, so which is the canon date in the OG game? It was the Aerith one because of in fucking story reasons, dude. The Aerith one was mega important because in, in the Aerith one, it literally reveals stuff about like, like how Aerith knows that Cloud is not who he says he is type of shit. It doesn't come down to like, you know, relationship affinity or anything like that. No, it was like, it was there because it, it moved the plot forward because she's about to fucking die. Because in, uh, in my in my head canon, you know, in the OG, it was always the Aerith date was the default. The Aerith date was the one that made the most sense. Everything else was just sort of fun. It's the same shit, you know? Giving, giving a kiss scene, giving a Yuffie scene, a, a Red 13 scene. All this stuff just adds more context to the story, but it's like, who gives a shit? <laughs> Only certain sides of the fan base give a shit. And that's the thing. They, 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 what they are doing is their best to appease you, you absolute beautiful people with sound arguments and clearly defined goals. You, you love this game for very specific reasons and all they're doing is giving you fan service. That's what this comes across as. And they literally admit it. They literally admit it. Enjoy it for what it is, but is it, is it critical to the story? No. The book says Reno is bored out of his mind while taking his extended vacation to recover from injuries, but he's ready to jump back into the fray as he's ready to get his revenge against Cloud and the others. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to the Reno and Rude arc in the next game. That'll be exciting. It'll be exciting to see them back together in action again. Oh, here we go. You ready? Here we go, chat. Aerith's fate is, we don't know. No shit. If this comes to a conclusion that they don't want us to know exactly what's going on. Yeah, as someone that analyzed the fuck out of the events of the game. Yes, there is no discernible evidence in any direction because there's always some weird thing that refutes it every time. Every time it seems like we come to the conclusion that there's multiple timelines or two different Aeriths or one Aerith or one where she's dead permanently or it, every single time we do this, we come to the same fucking conclusion they don't want us to know. There's always some goofy Red 13 thing or some rainbow or some weird character interaction that, that it's like, dude, they literally put this here to throw us off. The only true answer is that Aerith is Chadley. Here's the summary, Aerith's fate. It's hard to tell whether she lives or dies. No shit. This is what they're telling us as like the developers. Based on what we see, it can lead to different interpretations. No shit. However, what is confirmed is the party sees something completely different than Cloud. Yeah, we came to that conclusion. The party fights Genova with full limits. Um, they're full of anger except for Cloud, and Barrett even says that the battle is mourning for her. Yeah, we came to that conclusion. There's a scene where Cloud is holding Aerith and speaking something, but it's drowned out by the noise, so we don't know what is being said. Yeah, yeah, okay, we know. After the fight at the Forgotten Capital, Aerith appears next to Cloud, but Tifa cannot see her. Yeah, we picked up on that shit. You'd be surprised on how, how many people miss this. Don't get me wrong. I know. To, to a lot of people, Aerith is just alive in the end. Damn, they didn't kill her. Yes. Yes, that is 100% a conclusion that you could come to on first view. I think that will be also utilized in the next game. That'll be utilized that seemingly, according to our main character, she's just fine. Uh, the party seems to be sitting at the edge of a lake where Aerith should have been laid to rest from the original game. Yeah, we know. It is unknown how and where Aerith came to aid Cloud in the last fight against Sephiroth. Yes, we don't, we definitely aren't gonna understand what the hell Omni Aerith is yet. We're not supposed to. Omni Aerith, AKA Livestream Aerith, 
We're not supposed to know yet, but she literally talks through our Aerith at several points in this game. She's Chadley is what I'm trying to say. Is Aerith at the end actually alive? Or is she from the live stream? Or is she a... Damn, bro, they covered all three of the bases? Dude, they literally cover all three of them. I just, I just said this. Is she alive or is she from the live stream or is she a hallucination? They literally covered them all. It's like they know and they refute every single one. This is why everyone's theory sucks, including my own. I, I boil down to this shit. This is the one that I boil down to. Aerith being in a hallucination from Cloud in his head doesn't just boil down to Cloud's head is fucked up. Chat, why is Cloud's head is fucked up? Cloud's head is fucked up because of several things and mental trauma. And also he's got an alien in his fucking brain that he sees weird shit throughout the entirety of Remake and the new game, right? So him hallucinating shit for certain reason isn't just a coping mechanism for him. It can also be weaponized. It can also be like, literally he's seeing this character for nefarious reasons, which is like the Genova thing. I think like the Genova manipulation is the same consideration as a hallucination. It's the same shit. That's where I'm, I'm not saying like, it's physically a freaky alien. Like, no, because Sephiroth in his head is a Genova manipulation, like the entire time. It's Sephiroth in his head fucking with things. Answer is all the above. I kind of agree, right? I kind of agree that at some points it's live stream Aerith and at some points it's a hallucination. I completely agree that that ending is like, it's Cloud coping at the start and it's like live stream Aerith, like trying to help him. You're going to be okay, dude. And then it's him like, you know, creating a mental block that she's fine. But eventually when she's gone, he doesn't accept that. And it turns into a hallucination, practically a coping mechanism to the point later when this happens, I feel like this is actually weaponization. This is now a manipulation to fuck him up even more. So I think it's all of them. To be real, it could literally be all of them. It's just cool that they're acknowledging it, right? It's cool that like, oh yeah, all that crazy theorizing we did in conclusion drawing, they, they tell us right here. And they're like, hey, you know what? It actually, you're not supposed to know yet. Thank you. Yeah, we got that. The world where Zack is alive, or the world where Aerith and Cloud appeared in the Sector 5 sums has a crack in the sky. Does it mean to signify the end of the world or... Oh shit. So wait a minute. We're saying that the people in the Sector 5 slums in that place looked at that shit in the sky and thought it was the end of the world. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's something else. So there you go. That's new. That's actual new information. Everyone in the game is just assuming it is the end of the world. According to the devs, maybe it's not. So who knows? We're not supposed to know yet. It's a sign of them converging. It could be converging. It can be, you know, combining. It can be a portal. It could be anything, right? We don't know. Rainbows and shit. We have no clue. All we're saying is that this is kind of spoilery that all of our characters look at that shit in the sky and believe it is doom. They believe it is the end of everything. The devs are now proposing to here. Maybe it's not. So that's huge information, dude. That's actually massive. That that throws a wrench into the majority of what most of us were interpreting the final CG ending and what the hell was going down in the, the Sector 5 areas. That's super interesting. The cracks in the sky lead to Fortnite. Yes, that's how you do it, man. When Cloud and Tifa eventually make it to Fortnite, they get sucked into a portal that looks just like the crack in the sky and they land next to a giant banana dude. The fuck? And then Cloud pulls out an AK-47. Um, profile for Rude says he might look scary on the outside, but deeply cares about his comrades. The book mentions that he shows a side of himself here that he deeply misses his partner after keeping up with Elena and her temper. Yeah, we got that impression. That Rude, Rude, Rude's missing his best friend. I think that's, uh, I think that's it. She got a new tweet up. Oh shit. Oh god damn, this looks like a big one, chat. Part three, main story has been completed. Honk honk. Nomura thinks they will perhaps start voice recording in the near future. He remarks that Katasi proposed an idea to him about something very important to include, even though it wasn't in the original game. And Nomura is pondering how to deliver. He thinks it will surely make people happy if they can do it well. I trust you guys. I legit do. On all ends. Nomura, everybody, I trust you guys. Nomura, well, Nomura also talked about the the fact that Wu Tai is going to be significantly bigger in the next game, and that was one of the biggest pain in the asses 
Oh, shit! Damn, I didn't even think about it until chat said it. If this means this shit, please, dog. Please, dear Jesus Christ. This is the dream, chat. This is the dream. I mean, I, it's Nomura specifically saying this because this is his movie. He like also like wrote this shit, right? Directed it. If we get a playable Advent children sequence, we'll lose my fucking mind. I, and I, we were, I've been hoping this shit would show up ever since we, we heard about like the Advent children references in the first game where it's like, yo, what? What are you saying? I'm saying, and I've said this many times before, even back when we played Remake Part 1, they were alluding towards Advent Children shit. Like it had happened and it was f like a thing that took place. We were, we were referencing characters and shit. So it's like, yo, what the fuck is going on? I was saying that I hope that at some point at the end of it, we reference the other, like the, the fact that Cloud has fought Sephiroth in, in the future. The fact that eventually Cloud and Sephiroth go at it. And in a vision, in some way, we get to control that. In a vision, in some way, we get to control, like, a fusion sword and fight Sephiroth in, like, a unique dreamscape that is Advent Children, where Cloud is getting flashbacks to other timelines or, like, futures where he has fought Sephiroth and shit. So anyway, we, we thought of this when Kadaj, Laz, and Yazu were effectively referenced at the end of Remake. You have to fight them, but they're in crazy ethereal forms and shit. If we get a time jump to... Not time jump, but effectively just like a vision. The same thing that happens in Cloud's head. It would go so fucking hard. It would be not a full remake of Advent Children. We don't need that. It just needs to be a little sequence of like the final battle. It just needs to like bring up and dude, they already, they already give us this shit. This already happens at the end. Just give us Advent Children alternate costumes. It's just a reason to have that. So I'm just saying that, like, there is there is literally a thematic reason why we can make this shit take place. Where it can be, like, Cloud finding the strength to defeat Sephiroth. Hey, dude, like, whatever character, it's Aerith trying to give him this information. You did this before. You can do this again type shit. Look how much you beat his ass all these other times. Like, if he doubts himself. And it's like, oh, how do you build that strength again? It's like, well, you did it in Advent Children. Check this shit out. And they tease it with the guitar and the, the goddamn Sephiroth theme. So, buddy. Yeah, if this is the shit that's being teased at the end about Cloud being able to, like, commune and traverse, if not be in, be in contact with other worlds and timelines, because they do that already. He, like, has visions of the future and shit. Then maybe he'll get a vision of this in, like, a dream or something like that. He remarks that Katasi proposed an idea to him about something very important to include, even though it wasn't in the original game, and Nomura is pondering how to deliver, he thinks it'll make people happy if they do it well. And as much as Advent Children isn't the greatest movie ever, you cannot deny Advent Children is massively influential. Advent Children fight scenes and choreography especially, massively influential. To the point where now we're seeing it. Now it's like showing up in media and stuff that like people grew up with that shit. And even even watching it nowadays, recently in theaters. No, dude, the fight scenes are fucking amazing. Like the the build up to the fight scenes and shit are literally peak. The storytelling in between sucks. It's not good. And the characters are also not that good. But when it gets to like characters in fight scenes and stuff, it's like, Jesus Christ, this is so cool. And it still is really cool to this day. If you're able to give us that, give us like one of those moments actually in the end of this game, I will lose my fucking mind. What he's actually talking about is the legendary sex scene materia. That's what he's talking about. It's going to be a materia that you have to find. You're going to have to breed 12 gold chocobos and there's going to be like a one in a million chance that you get the legendary sex scene materia that's what he's talking about uh kitase hopes to deliver an amazing product for part three without having to sacrifice quality he says the reason rebirth was such an efficient development period was because they retained the same staff and part three will also have the same team fuck yeah dude fucking fuck, just so fucking happy yeah, sorry. He mentions Rebirth was actually done within three years since about one year was developing the DLC. And he hopes to be able to stick with that schedule for part three. Fucking 2027! No more eight year development shit! 2027, bro. He just said it. Um, and he kind of acknowledges that like the, the, the first year, because granted, don't get me wrong. Rebirth was four years. Katase might not be able to count, but it was four years. However, I think he can count. He's giving us perspective, pretty much saying that one year after the game was out, 
was committed to DLC development. Yes, that, that came out like about, would have been done about a year after the initial game. So they had three years after that to produce and release FF7 Rebirth. And they did. And they did that during fucking COVID, dude. They literally did that shit during a, a global pandemic where everybody had to change their way of life and working ability. So somehow they made one of the most content feature rich games that has ever been released, literally ever been released from Square, especially within three year time frame. And that's because because of this chat, I don't think we realize how big of a how big of a deal this is and how, how difficult this is. When you learn a bit more about how game development works, you do not keep the same crew ever. Priorities happen where it's like, oh, suddenly uh, Final Fantasy 16 needs help or whatever. I'm just saying whatever. Kingdom Hearts 4 needs help. We, these other games need assistance. We need to get people that have experience with this engine. We got to get them in here, man. There's, there's higher priority here. We got to release this thing to make money. Okay, cool. So what happens? You splinter teams constantly. It always happens. You, we need the talent of these other places. We got to finish this shit. It takes priority. It seemed like there was a conscious effort with the remake series. We're keeping the same people. Don't let them go away. They said they kept 80% of the staff. So you know what that means? Nobody had to learn anything new. Everybody had to figure out new problems, but tackling the weird issues that game development proposes always introduces a huge element, which is time. Time to learn new shit, Time to solve new problems with completely new people. You waste so much time in game development now because games are so much more complicated than they used to be. So the majority of game development just goes into that. How do we make this shit work, dude? How do we even operate this stuff? We don't even know how to get this online. How do we, how's the game gonna fucking look? What the fuck do we do? What I'm saying is that this is one of the, Jesus Christ, this is one of the only games that is releasing with legacy skill, where the majority of their development team has legacy skill from the previous game, and they're just going straight forward into the next one. And that goes to show you, when you retain all of that legacy skill, albeit this isn't a practical situation for all game development, but when you retain all those people working on a similar game, going right into the next thing, how fast shit can come online. How fast, like, art and assets come online when you just go when you don't have to figure shit out like crazy, you know? It was one of the reasons why, yeah, movies like Lord of the Rings and shit were developed the way they were. In fact, that's actually a great comparison. The Lord of the Rings trilogy is a pretty good comparison when they when they committed to making three full movies and it's like, let's just go one to one to one, like back to back to back. Let's just keep going. Keep everything that we learn and just do the next one and then do the next one. It'll be a big commitment. We're in here for the long haul. But effectively, that trilogy doesn't feel like weird and different. It's it's different than something like even Star Wars or Back to the Future, which none of those movies feel like they're cohesive with the other. They all have very different tones and different directors and all this shit. They're great, don't get me wrong. But just by comparison to other films, there's huge gaps where like the goals of the trilogy are different now, you know? This is getting the Lord of the Rings treatment, not the Hobbit treatment, Jesus Christ. It's getting the loader treatment. Keep everyone on board. I just need them for a long fucking time and then we'll make it work, you know? This is insanely good news, dude. And the good news about it is that they effectively Square Enix, you know, budgetary. It's like their baby, right? For Kitase and all like the biggest heads and uh, Nojima for Nomura and even Uematsu, like the biggest heads of Final Fantasy. These are the gods of the company type shit, right? It's clear when you hear from them how important this game is, how important it was for this series. And the, the greatest quote from all of this shit was when Nomura and Katase were initially gonna do the remake project and they came to conclusion that they were gonna do it. And Nomura has this amazing quote where as soon as development kind of started when they were figuring out what it was going to be, he's like, I immediately regretted it. <laughs> he's like, oh, God, I immediately regretted doing this because it's going to take so long and it's going to be so much work. <laughs> he's, he was immediately like, oh, shit, <laughs> like this is going to be so much. It's in the music interview. It's hilarious. He laughs about it now where he's like, this was such a bad idea. <laughs> it's going to take us so much fucking work and time, dude. <laughs> it's funny that 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 was probably him in like 2013 because again ff7 remake 
was revealed in 2015. Its gameplay was revealed in 2015, right? So the game was already in a functioning state by 2015 in, in a different developer at the time, in the hands of CyberConnect2. So that isn't when the game was announced and it was like, hey, we're making a game. No, it wasn't like 2015. You have to start thinking back. This goes back to like 2012, maybe 2013, that they even took to get the game to that state. Just thinking about it, Nomura has been on this project for 10 plus years, going all the way back to like, way before the game was first shown to us way before the game so it's like he's been on this project for like 11 years type shit woof dude if if he makes this shit happen i'll kiss him i'll fucking kiss you dude i won't i'll ask first i'll be polite i will be polite but if you manage to get an advent children scene into this game by the end of part three i'll give you a goddamn smooch i'll ask first okay be like no thank you i'm like fair enough i wouldn't be like this chat okay I'd be polite about it. So I'm going to tell you, like, as much as you guys want that ending to happen, that isn't the ending that should happen for Final Fantasy VII. They should, I think Square Enix, everybody involved, should grow a pair of balls and give us the true ending. No, it's a happy ending. No, it is. You know what a happier ending is? Zack and Cloud are alive, and Zack, Cloud, and Aerith all just start kissing at the same time. And they invite, like... Tifa in, and Tifa starts kissing Zack, Cloud, and Aerith at the same time. And then they also pull in Barrett, and Barrett and Zack and Cloud and Tifa and Aerith all start kissing. And then they grab Red 13, and then Red 13 and Barrett and Zack and Cloud and Tifa and Aerith start kissing. And then they grab Vincent and... Yeah, I think you get the idea. And then the legendary sex scene happens. <laughs> no, it's a happy ending. No, it <laughs> I did that for the shipping community, by the way. New tweet from Audrey. It's just happening live, right? We're getting live updates to this shit. This is amazing, dude. To be real, I'm getting more personal gratification out of this Ultimania than I thought I was. Probably even more than Remake. I'm really happy with this shit. Um, Kitase has hopes that the World of Seven make... Oh my god, bro! <laughs> we said... <laughs> Bro, we talked about this. <laughs> so do you think FF, what are they going to do after FF7 is done? And I'm like, buddy, you think Final Fantasy 7 is done after the remake project is done? Really? You think they're just done with Final Fantasy 7 after this shit? <laughs> really? They're guaranteed moneymaker? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So Kitase has hopes that the world of seven may continue on after finishing the project trilogy, but they need to wrap up part three first and foremost. Yes, this is, this is the focus. This is the big deal. He thinks part three will perhaps be his last involvement with the game in the seven series due to his age. In lieu of that, he wants to bring this trilogy to a close, to a close with hopes that Cloud and other characters will be happy at the end. He wants to finish the trilogy on a positive note without leaving behind any unfinished business. That's just his own personal opinion. Yeah, so th this was this was in another interview recently where Nojima wanted a big happy ending. Um, and this is why he says this is his personal opinion. He wanted a big happy ending for the end of FF7 remake trilogy. He was eventually convinced I think it was it was inferred that it was he was convinced that that is potentially not where this is going. Why? Because the rest of the dev team doesn't want that. The rest of the dev team is like, no, like the big theme of Final Fantasy VII is loss and dealing with loss. So we have to keep some of those things, right? So it seemed that he had different ambitions of where, because these characters have been ar around, he's like, you know, these characters are like his baby. He just wants to, he just wants to give them an all a big happy ending where everyone's kissing in the end, right? But according to parts of the developer, the, the dev team, they don't, they don't, they don't share the same sentiment. They were the like, nah, we don't think that's like the best way to go. So there was some points of contention there. FF7 is not an entirely happy story, not entirely. It has a satisfying conclusion. It, it's bittersweet, is what it is. And it, FF7 should be a bittersweet story. That's the fucking point, man. But this is cool. Without leaving behind unfinished business. Yeah. There has already been several notes in this Ultimania that the next game is going to be about answering questions, which is cool. That's cool. It, it seems like they know that you've built up so much intrigue and so much, like, so much fucking subtext, dude. Unanswered subtext across two games that you're clearly building up towards something 
We have not gotten answers for this shit yet. And you're only building up more intrigue. We need to have a game that starts, starts paying out. Can we get a game that pays off in some way that really starts paying off? It seems like they're aware of that, which is good. It's almost like us as players. It's like, we gotta let you guys know you've been teasing us for a long time. It's like been now four plus years of teasing stuff without a lot of answers. And it's starting to feel like, ugh, come on, dude, Jesus. I get it, the game's amazing. Don't get me wrong, the game's amazing. But for the people that are really curious where this shit is going, it's like, can you just give us something? Can we get some answers? Can we just use the term omni Aerith at some point? <laughs> oh, this is so satisfying, dude. Oh my God, this shit is so good. I mean, that's the whole point of this Ultimania is to get you hyped about this game and also the next game, but it's doing a very good job. I'll give them that credit, right? The whole point of this book is to get you excited about what was in the previous game that you just played and also to get you really excited about the next thing that they're doing. Yeah, I get it, but it's doing a very good fucking job at that. It's making me very confident that they are aware of the shit that they're doing and they're like worried and nervous about this ending, which you should be, dude. You should be. The goddamn devs stole from us our goodbye. You stole it from us. Excuse me, it feels like a betrayal. In several ways, it feels like a character betrayal to steal the goodbye of a character. And it isn't like they didn't know that. And that's what it's coming across as. It isn't, it isn't the fact that they just did that and they're like, we made a, we made a cool thing, check it out, bye-bye. No, no, no. It feels like they're aware of that to enhance the next game, to give us an even better moment in the future which is bold. And it also lines up with what Nomura was saying about part two, where he's like kind of nervous about the way people are going to approach part two. Why am I, why am I not passing full judgment on this yet? Because we have not seen the full story. We don't, we have not seen the way this full story concludes. We don't know. It's like judging the Lord of the Rings trilogy after finishing two towers and then coming to a conclusion. Why the fuck would you do that? Why would you do that? The story's not done, dude. The painful part is that this isn't a movie series that comes out one movie a year. This is a massive video game undertaking. Unlike anything ever done before, this remake project is unlike anything ever done before, where we're going to have our players wait almost 10 fucking years to get the resolution to this story. 10 fucking years practically from if you count the time we were waiting before in between and in between it's a long nothing like this has ever been in the industry bro there's literally nothing like this ever in the history of video games that makes a commitment that is this long this in depth and has continued with their characters for such a long period of time it isn't a love letter it's like a marriage proposal we're almost asking you to marry this proposition because trust me, in the long haul, it's gonna be worth it when it eventually gets to the finality. Are they gonna stick the final? We don't know. We're, right now, we're at the end of Two Towers. We don't know. Uh, new Audrey tweet. Nomura has an interesting remark about when you fight Sephiroth during the ending battle. <clears throat> Sephiroth's existence can actually transcend worlds and exist at the same time in multiple worlds. So he doesn't care about time. When Zack comes to help Cloud fight Sephiroth, they both exist in a moment where the two worlds join. Further, when Zack, Cloud, and the other party members all fight Sephiroth Reborn, they are presumably existing in separate worlds. They are still fighting the same entity. So this is the same as the end of Remake. And the characters talk about it. Where at the end of Remake, we kind of know this, right? I kind of got that too. At the end of Remake, the characters even address it where it's like, like and can, can you recognize like how crazy it was, like what we did like back there. Uh, and even in Advent Children, they talk about that too, where it's like, Remember when we got all that strength at the end of, you know, FF7? It's like a weird singularity of crazy shit going down at one point, you know? Where like multiple timelines, multiple realities are colliding in at one spot. <clears throat> Why? Again, boil it down. Why? 
Why does all this wild shit happen at the end of these games? What is the actual reason, chat? What is the actual reason for this multiverse shenanigans, fate arbiters, this large scale shit? What is the reason? For boss fights. The reason is to have a culmination of crazy boss fights and big epic moments at the end of each game, because there's a problem with the trilogy. There's a big problem. The conclusion to every game without those elements is boring AF. The conclusion is like, oh, so we're just gonna fight the big motorball thing at the end, and then the credits are gonna roll? Mm, that's not super satisfying. Oh, at the end of Rebirth, we're just gonna fight Genova, and that's it. And it's gonna roll the music, and that's it. No, no, no. So instead, they, they effectively had to add big finalities for every single game. At the end of every single one, there needs to be some big overarching connection, right? Some connection that declines the fact that it's relatively anticlimactic because this needs to be individual video games. We're telling three parts of a story. We have to bring all this shit together with a narrative that sort of connects it all, which is the Arbiters of Fate, the timeline shit, fate, all that kind of shit, right? That's the big reason. And then they sprinkle in other things, which is like, so Zack can also live because of this. That'll be fun. And also, we don't know if we can save Aerith or not. Maybe you can save Aerith, you know? Genova is the closest one where that could have worked, right? And the way they handled Genova is incredible. The way that fight is effectively handled at the end of Rebirth is super cool. Like falling, but the way they... Did anybody notice that the way they handled Genova doesn't make any sense? Where what he's saying here, where he's saying that like they presumably exist in a separate world, they're fighting the same entity. You're pretty much fighting Genova the same way you would fight Genova at the end of Final Fantasy VII. It's like you're falling through the life stream type shit. You're like, what the hell is happening, dude? Where, what is going on? Where are we? It's all, you're moving all over the place. Like you're traversing from one place to the next. It's just insane. All it really is is a storytelling is a storytelling tool to just enhance the stakes, to just make this more important and more epic than it normally is in the OG game, right? In the OG game, it's just like on on the exact same big platform that Aerith died on, you fight Genova, you know? And you could do something similar to that, and it would be fine, but it would definitely lack like an impact. It would lack a a finality. You know, because you obviously are just waiting for the next game where all the big epic fights do happen. To me, that's like the reasoning behind it. And here's my conclusion why I don't think we're going to have to worry about all this world stuff and a lot of this timeline shit anymore. Because effectively, they needed that shit for part one and two. What about part three? Do you need big timeline stuff and fate and cross paths, destiny, arbiters, all this crazy? Do you need that to amplify the, uh, the events of the end of Final Fantasy VII? No, you do not. You have giant weapon fights and more crazy Genova. You have the fucking one-winged angel. You have like, you, you have everything, man. You have so much to work with at the end. You don't need all this shit anymore. To me, the timeline stuff and all of this Arbiter of Fate shit was here to amplify elements of the first two games to give us a more impactful final game. Supernova, Knights of the Round, all the cool shit in FF7 effectively happens in the end. So I don't know. To me, that's where I kind of feel the timeline shit sort of breaks down, where I feel like, yeah, we don't have to worry about all this crazy world stuff. We're going to get, we still need explanations for like how and where this shit is happening. What the hell is the edge of creation? How the fuck is Sephiroth like hyper aware of shit? What is he talking about? Like, I will not die and I won't have you die type of stuff. Why does he need Cloud so bad? What the fuck is seven seconds to the end? What the hell's going on there? There's still several things that we don't know, right? But for it to be an overarching plot point, I don't think it's going to be there all over the place. I really don't. Because the, these, these, these moments at the end of the game, at the end of part one and two, sort of are the exact same as OG FF7 when Cloud goes through the wormhole of his mind to a different world where seemingly Sephiroth is alive, shirtless, and ready to whoop your ass. And it's like, they propose the exact same shit in this game, that Cloud's mind hole is actually like a different world a different existence type of shit, you know? And, and, uh, and, and we interpreted that as like, oh, he's defeating Sephiroth internally, right? Yeah, I get it. But, you know, we find out later that's actually not true from Advent Children, you know? Yeah, there's technically seven different realities. All I'm saying is that I don't think that's going to be 
major pro plot relevant stuff in the next game as much as they're 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 used to amplify characters and to to introduce new elements without hopefully having it again being this big looming thing throughout the entirety of the series because it feels like both games already are 95% faithful to the originals. I don't think by the end of the game it's going to mean that much, but don't get me wrong, I think it needs to be explained. I don't think that needs to be the conclusion of all this shit, but I think they got to give us some answers on this stuff of what the fuck is, where where are they? Can we get some actual explanations of that shit, you know? <laughs> Vincento, uh, Vincent's real age is unknown, but looks around 2070, sleeps a lot because he wants to suppress the monsters within him. He's super bad with technology, as seen when he doesn't even know what the Shinra card reader was out of battery. He's more adept with old tech, like the radio on the tiny Bronco. Cute. I love this part. I love the commitment to Vincent being a comedy relief character. Because they do that. Vincent's played for, um, super serious, but also comedy relief. And I love it. Oh shit. During the scene of Cloud deflecting Sephiroth's sword, Cloud has a lot of noise flashes through his mind, and Nomura says there are a lot of elements regarding that, but for now, all they can say is that you can think of it as Cloud's state of mind rejecting what is happening. He is saying it. Yeah, okay, sick, bro. This was one of my first interpretations of it. Called it. It was in my head that as that scene is happening, you're watching Cloud actively repress shit. You're watching him, he's saying it and he's repressing it. He is saying those things in the moment. He's saying all the stuff he says from the OG game, but he's repressing it. All you're getting is like him crying and, and pretty much falling the fuck apart. Where he's saying those things in the moment, it isn't a flashback to time and shit. It's not even timeline shit. It's just him actively block it out, block it out, block it out, block it out. Fuck this, fuck my brain, block it out, you know? So he says that shit to Sephiroth, but we don't see him say it. We're gonna get it later. We're literally getting it later. That's what I, that's what I first saw that as. It could be another timeline thing, sure, but the, again, it's meant to be confusing him pretty much stating it's not a timeline thing, it's him actively rejecting what's happening, which fucks up Cloud even more, right? Think about it, that also breaks down Cloud and his mental situation even harder than we were thinking, where it's like, oh, you know, maybe some multiverse shit is happening and he says that in another multiverse. No, 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 no. This dude is repressing the shit he is saying in the moment, where he's feeling these things all at the same time, but he is blocking it. It's supposed to be confusing. So Tifa doesn't see it then. Uh, Tifa shows up after. <clears throat> Tifa and the party show up after. She has flashes too. Yeah, Tifa has flashes of like multiple things happening, right? Of multiple things happening, 100%. Tifa's also been in the live stream. Tifa has also been inside the live stream, which is different than before. So maybe, just maybe, she has some sort of an effect on this moment. Maybe her perspective is a little bit different than everybody else. Not everybody else sees this two scenario thing. Just Tifa sees that. Even Cloud isn't familiar with the two scenario thing. Cloud thinks he saved her. Oh, turns out I didn't save her type shit. And it, here, here, here's the crazy part. It couldn't even be Tifa glitching out. It could it, it literally be jumping back and forth in between what Cloud sees and what she sees. It's not clear. Again, we don't have the answers. We're getting little bits of what the answers actually are right now. We're not supposed to know yet. The only thing that isn't an interpretation now is what the developers are literally saying. Cloud, that's not two timelines you're looking at. That's Cloud actively rejecting what's happening. So to me, this just lends more cadence to the Cloud mental state issue. Instead of there being multiple realities where one's alive and one isn't, and why say things in one, we live in that timeline type of stuff. To me, this sort of boils down to what our initial thought was, where convergence has happened now. It might seem like there's two different clouds experiencing this at two different times, but that's also cloud 
experiencing different things at different times, remembering things at different things at different times. Cloud is already doing that throughout the whole game. So we'll see, you know. It could be both. It literally could be both. It could actually be both.